So, the official Dark Souls Design Works books are incredible. They have interviews and concept art that give wonderful insight into the development process behind these games. But the thing I want to talk to you about today isn't in the Dark Souls Design Works. Instead, it was specifically left out. Archived on Reset Era are these fantastic images, allegedly drawn by an artist named Jokus Wang. First up, there's this dark hellscape, where your eyes are drawn towards a bleeding sun. There's art that looks like it might have inspired Kanehurst Library from Bloodborne. There's this gothic courtyard, which one commenter points out merges the Berlin Cathedral and the Louvre. There are these statues that might once have been graceful, but have become horrifically worn. But my personal favourite piece is this sort of abandoned sewer area, with just enough light filtering through to nourish gentle growths of moss. I love the verticality in this piece, and I love the way the artist uses light to draw you in to every little nook. It's masterful. Now, that first image should have been familiar to anyone who saw the Dark Souls 3 leaks that were published all the way back in 2015. This famous screenshot showed that same bleeding sun and a world reduced to a hellish ruin. I remember those leaks were especially shitty for From Software back then, because we know now that they were clearly outdated at the time and misleading. But looking back now, along with all this artwork, these things start to feel more like lost treasures to me, and I feel like they do wonders for the intrigue behind these games. I'll of course take this down if From Software or Jokus request it, but we get precious little insight into the development process and it's fun to imagine the game that could have been. Of course, if you want some official insight into these games, go and buy the official Design Works books. They're well worth it if you can find them for sale. Next, number two. It's no secret that when you kill Ornstein first in Dark Souls 1, Smo grows larger. And when you kill Smo first, Ornstein grows larger. Or does he? Recently, Zully the Witch revealed this clever camera trick that happens in this scene, whereby Ornstein actually stays the same size, while Smo's body and the arena shrinks instead. Considering there isn't a functional size scaling value for character models in the original Dark Souls, Zully speculates that this camera trick would have been far easier for them to implement. These secrets videos have first and foremost become a way for me to point you towards other creators and their creations, things that can enrich your appreciation of the Souls series. Lately, Zully the Witch in particular has been absolutely killing it. The YouTube algorithm has finally taken a liking to her short, entertaining videos, and I noticed as well that it all started with this one. As you know, if you kill Ornstein first, you get Super Smo, and if you kill Smo first, you get Super Ornstein. But what happens if you kill them both at exactly the same time? By using an AoE attack to force a tie, the winner is Ornstein. That's because the next stage of the fight is actually tied to whichever boss's death animation ends first, and Smo has a faster death animation. But what happens if you kill Ornstein first and then Smo quickly after to line up their animations? Well, you can't. From Software thought of this, and they added immortality to the other character once their partner dies. Interestingly, if animation length is removed as a factor with hacks, and you set both of their HP to zero, then there is code in the game that enables Ornstein as the winner in this scenario, every time. Luckily, this isn't possible in regular gameplay, because it also softlocks the fight. Another thing I found fascinating is how they work around boss health bar issues in some fights. In fights like the Four Kings or the Deacons, there's actually another member hidden off screen, and it's their health bar that you see at the bottom of your screen, and they take damage on behalf of all of the other members that you hit. This also goes for the Gale boss fight, where second phase Gale waits in this structure in the distance. When phase two starts during the cutscene, this damaged second phase teleports down and the fight continues. From Software tend to remove a lot of cut content from their games these days, but this wolf snuck through on a PS4 patch for Dark Souls 3. It bears resemblance to the old Wolf of Farron Covenant model that you find in this tower, down to having the same little bronze bracelet. Once, it seems, this model was planned to be a part of the Abyss Watchers boss fight. Here, in a cutscene found by MickB123 and uploaded by Dropoff, we see the wolf appear as a part of the Phase 2 Revival cutscene. Here's a hot take. I'm glad the wolf wasn't added as a part of the fight. 
I think we have enough wolf fights in the Souls series, don't you? We've talked before about how there are grabs that you can escape in Dark Souls by pressing R1 and L1, but for many years such a thing was considered to be a glitch. Turns out it has its own dedicated systems. In this video, Zuli showcases how grabs technically have their own HP. Each escapable grab has 25 HP, and each press of R1 or L1 reduces that HP bar by 1. Get it to zero and your character performs the escape throw animation. Having the HP of the grab actually visible makes your button mashing feel so much more meaningful and I'm kind of surprised that they didn't just add like a sort of status meter for this in game. One reason they might not have added that is because not every grab can be escaped from. In a recent Demon Souls Prepare to Cry, we talked about Boletaria's proclivity for slaves and how important they were to their wars and to their greater society. Turns out, slaves are more entrenched in this game than I thought. As you head up to fight Alant, the final boss, take a look through the walls of the elevator. Hidden within the mechanism are two slave soldiers, working tirelessly to bring visitors up to their master. Next, sticking with Demon Souls, everyone knows that the Manta Rays detach from the Storm King to start attacking you, but did you know that the projectiles that the Storm King shoots are also small Manta Rays? I guess Bluepoint wanted to give you an excuse to use that awesome photo mode. Recently, a fantastic article that you should read was posted to the PlayStation blog, which details the process behind capturing the incredible animations of the Demon Souls remake. And when you see these actual people hefting around these heavy props to mimic the weight of the weapons in game, you really do appreciate the effort that went into this. Because the tough thing to get right about this remake was that the cadence of animations and movement wasn't supposed to be changed much from the original, but they did want to update the animations themselves, and they updated every single one of them. One of the performers says, Performed too quickly, the movements would lack clear arcs and silhouettes. Performed too slowly, they might lose their weight and inertia. And they said that they had to focus really hard on where an animation starts and ends as well. The article is a great read. It explains how and why this project was so difficult, even for people with over 20 years of motion capture experience. The most striking animations in the remake are the brutal and complex reposts and backstabs, all of which have different animations, depending on the weapon you're using and also how many hands you're carrying it with. This game is a technical marvel, and a big part of me wishes that From Software had a bit of that blue point polish within them. Don't get me wrong, From Software's current game development cycle is incredible, it's super efficient, and they pump out quality games with quality gameplay way faster than most studios, but with Elden Ring looking a lot like Dark Souls 3, their game appearance is starting to age a little, you have to admit that, and I wonder when we might see a sort of visual leap forward from them. I'm not saying it has to happen now, but sooner or later you have to admit something is going to give. Moving on to Sekiro. We've talked about the Gyobu skip before, and even the Blazing Bull skip after that, but what if you perform these glitches during the Gauntlets of Strength? One Twitter user did just that, and shared it with me, revealing this world that renders in in a strange way. You should try it, and see what oddities you can find, but the best place to visit by far seems to be the Silvergrass Field, which shows a lightning storm during the day, with surreal reflections and lighting. Number 11. We've all seen, or heard, the sentries in Sekiro who hammer a metal pan with a metal rod, but did you know they can actually attack you? Since they die in one hit and they usually stand apart from other enemies, not many people would notice this, but stand in melee range and parry them and you'll even be able to perform a fairly unique riposte animation to kill them. I learned about this from Ongbao a Sekiro master who uploads these stunning clips of him flawlessly killing bosses in this game. Not only are there no errors in these clips, but he weaves together interesting combos with prosthetic weapons and jumps, which leads to some incredible takedowns. For someone like me, who really appreciates Sekiro's combat more than any other Souls game, they are well worth a sub. Now, Sekiro's combat is good and all, but this is gameplay. Poison Rolling. Researched by Limit Breakers a few months ago, we learned that the hunter's roll inherits the effects of the poison gems that are attached to your right hand weapon. So poison comes in two flavors. In this game, there's slow poison, which builds up and then drains enemy HP over time, and there's rapid poison, which builds up and deals damage all at once. 
Relative to slow poison, rapid poison is a way better option, and it can even be used against some bosses that have really large HP pools to good effect. But relative to, you know, actually hitting the enemy with your weapon, or actually using good gems, no. Poison and rolling with it isn't that great. You can use the Hunter's Bone to speed up the process, but many bosses have 999 poison resistance anyway, so it kind of makes it a pointless endeavor. Unless you're Yumfa, and then it is good for entertaining challenge runs, so make sure you go and check that out as well. You'll learn even more secrets from their videos, like this one. So Limit Breakers also put out another video recently that shows off the Bow Bash of Demon Souls, which is something that hasn't really been showcased on YouTube before. It has a really strange input. It requires you to face away from your opponent and then snap in the opposite direction while pressing R2. Damage is modified by whichever bow you use and how upgraded that weapon is, but I'll leave it to Limit to teach you the specifics. But one of the best things about the remake is that all of this jank was left in this super modern PS5 title. Moving back to Bloodborne, there were some things in this game that I never thought we'd see, and Vicar Amelia's face before she transforms was one of them. Her side profile definitely gives you this younger and prettier impression, to my imagination anyway, but the reality is, yeah. Bloodborne has been explored a ton in recent years, thanks to the new tools that it has and talented modders like Lance MacDonald, though perhaps some things are better left unseen. Lance also has a video showing off a never-before-seen cutscene from the Wet Nurse boss, so go and check that out on his channel. Last, with a fantastic video idea, is Illusory Wall, who got AI to generate a real-life cast of Dark Souls based on their in-game models. Some of this stuff is absolutely stunning, some of it is absolutely horrifying, but all of it kind of makes me want a film based on these games for the first time. I mean, it'd be a nightmare trying to write a movie script for the Soul series, but as Illusory Wall notes in the video, a lot of these faces already bear resemblance to real-life actors. And here's one last crazy secret. Your middle mouse button can be used to open links in new tabs, and that's exactly what you should do for every link in the description, including the one for Soul Arts. The campaign is literally about to end, maybe like a day left now, so become a backer if you want to join us on this journey to produce something really special. Thank you for watching. Hopefully we get some Elden Ring news soon, and I'll see you in the next one.